uh, and improve. Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's September the 8th, 2021. I'm Tim Apatelli, your host, and I'd like to welcome you to What Now America? Today's title is Stop Texas Abortion Law, Expand the Supreme Court. You know, last week we, we had going to effect uh, Texas's abortion law, the new law, the law that said that women only have six months to know that they're pregnant and uh, perform the abortion. Law that says we're going to incentivize, we're going to give a bounty to private citizens to uh, sniff out rats and spy and um, basically prosecute anyone that's aided and abetted a woman for, to have an abortion in Texas. But the most grievous part of this new law is the fact that women will be forced, as if it were the dark ages, the, mid, the middle ages, force a woman to have a child when she's been raped or as equally as bad, um, is pregnant as a result of incest. And for those that don't know what the word incest means, it means by a family member. You know, Governor Abbott was uh, asked about this question about the provision of law about a woman being raped and or by uh, pregnant by a uh, result of incest. And he said, well, you know, rape's a lot, rape is a crime. And we're going to do everything in Texas to get the would-be rapers off the street. We're going to put them behind bars. Well, no, if you think about that question for a moment, doesn't that mean you have to find out who the rapist is, prosecute them, and jail them before they committed a crime? Governor Abbott, only in Texas. And with that, I go to my guests. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have Jay Fidel. And we have Winston Welch joining us on What Now America. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Jay, the, the, the title of this show is Stop Texas Abortion Law, Expand the Supreme Court. But before we get to that, that topic of the title, you know, there's so many different ways that this, this law could be challenged. I mean, it could be challenged by uh, a lower court ruling. It could be challenged and maybe um, some kind of uh, halted by the Department of Justice for not implementing current Roe v. Wade law that's been in the books for 50 years. It could be um, basically um, blunted by new legislation in Congress. Uh, there's so many different ways of trying to tackle this, this new abuse of law. Uh, what do you see as the most viable way to try to blunt it and or the most permanent way to, to stop this new law in Texas? Hmm. Uh, well, uh, Department of Justice uh, threatened to uh, take criminal proceeding against, against anybody who um, became a, a vigilante on the basis that that was a violation of a, of a statute uh, passed by Congress in 1871. Um, I'm not sure that's going to work. Um, I, I'm not sure that's going to work. But that, that, that's what they've said a couple of days ago. But what happened yesterday was even more remarkable. Um, remarkable, gentlemen, remarkable. So there's a bar uh, in um, Massachusetts, um, and it's, it's, I guess it's near Harvard, um, and it's called Grinnell's Den. Uh, Grinnell's Den has been there 50 years, and um, <clears throat> Grinnell, had, Grinnell was originally a, uh, a restaurant, <clears throat> but then it decided to be a bar in the early 70s, I guess, <clears throat> and they, uh, they applied for a liquor license. And there was a church immediately uh, behind them or a block behind them <clears throat> that opposed uh, the liquor license. Now, <clears throat> that, that opposition in most states would be, uh, you know, just one of many. Um, but in, in the state of Massachusetts, the law said that a church, specifically, a church could not only object, it could stop the application for a liquor license. All it had to do was say no. Its decision was binding. <clears throat> and when you think about it, that is exactly the same situation as we have uh, in Texas. Uh, any person can make the decision that there was a violation of the Texas law, that there was a, you know, illegal abortion, if you will, uh, and take, take matters into his own hands and become a vigilante. Okay? It's the same thing here with the, the church, maybe even worse. Uh, the church could decide that it was not a good idea to have a bar um, and make a decision and and act the the um the discretion of the state was essentially delegated to the church and this case went to the supreme court uh and guess who handled it on behalf of grinnell's uh, den this lawrence tribe 
Lawrence Tribe. Remember him? Um, out of Harvard, the constitutional lawyer. And he won uh, in a decision of eight to one, eight to one. Um, and that's that president has president had never been reversed. It's still the law. And it, you know, it's it stands for a number of things. Number one is the Supreme Court we have today. Uh, it ain't no Supreme Court like there was then. Um, and uh, they didn't do their homework. All those clerks that we pay all that money to, they didn't find this case. It's, you know, in in Lawrence Tribe's view of it, and he wrote an op-ed and appeared on uh, national media. Um, this was, uh, you know, not rocket science. This was this was reported in the Supreme Court Reporter. It was easy to find, and it is dead on. You can't uh, delegate the powers of the state to vigilantes. Um, so, and I I have some optimism about that. Uh, there are possibilities to distinguish that case, of course, um, but the Supreme Court is going to have trouble wrestling with a the case and b the fact they never cited the case or referred to it in any way, uh, even though it is very close on precedent. Are they re are, are they obligated to? I don't know. I, 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 I but I think that the you know the, the legal community is saying well, what happened here. Um, here's a case that was so close that it you know addresses the same issue constitutional interpretation case, and they didn't talk about it. it, it really sounds like they didn't know about it. They didn't know about it. They didn't do their homework about it. What kind of a Supreme Court do we have here anywhere? Um, this is likely to come up uh, in, in, in a substantive uh, evaluation review of that Texas uh, statute. So I hold some optimism up on that. And Rachel Maddow, the one who revealed it nationally on media, uh, and you got to give her credit for being perspicacious. And you got to give Lawrence Cr Tribe credit for handling the case first place and then re re you know, renewing his comments about it now. So, but the answer is, um, you know, we're in terrible shape on Roe v. Wade because you know what the Supreme Court wants to do. Um, they still hold a six to three majority. Um, and uh, they're, you know, they're, they're or even a five to four, you know, take Roberts out. Uh, so we, we have a problem with Roe v. Wade, and it, it's a it's the top of the iceberg in terms of the Supreme Court's ability to muck things up. They've been mucking things up for a while, and there's no surprise here. They'll do it again and again. So if you look at the dysfunctional elements, uh, uh, you know, of our government, you get Congress essentially dysfunctional, and uh, you know, talk about making bets, Winston. I'd like to make you a side bet on whether infrastructure ever gets through on whether voting rights ever get through, on whether immigration reform, gun control, post office, you name it, ever gets through. All of Biden's agenda is somehow stuck and um, it shows. So bottom line is Congress is um, you know, also ineffectual. Uh, the executive is made ineffectual by the filibuster and other considerations and the fact that he doesn't hold a real healthy majority. Um, so where are we? Do we have any branch of government, you know, left? And, and this is all in the face of the election of 2022. Okay, thank you, Jay. Hey, Winston, I'm going to stay on the same question. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's all sorts of uh, uh, angles to attack this this new law. But I get, think the the biggest, the most permanent one would be for Joe Biden to look at the possibility of expanding the number of seats on the bench of the Supreme Court. Does that, does this Texas law give new, new life to those discussions that took place just before the election? Well, it is, seems to be a sort of make your own rules, make your own constitution um, uh, time in America now. So uh, I, I suppose he could, but he's not going to. The country's it's so divided, so fractured, so, uh, and you're right, Jay, I think, I think the, the, you know, an abortion, when you talk about Roe versus Wade, that, I, I mean, from all I can understand, the court seemed to have got ahead of itself when the original ruling was made years ago. And the public has been um, divided about it, although majorities are in, uh, uh, you know, in favor of a woman's right to have an abortion. There has been always a significant minority that ha has said otherwise. But if you really break it down, you know, there's and look at it. Um, yeah, there's some a lot of nuances in there. But this one in in Texas, where I think even uh, the most diehard folks are, are well, I, I won't say that, but most people 
even if they're uh, against um, all, uh, almost all abortion, they would have some uh, cutout for uh, rape, incest, and, and the life of a woman. You would think that that would have made it in there just, just as, as a you know, pro forma thing. I think this, the Supreme Court not taking this up, you, you know, they don't have an army. They don't have anything except the goodwill of the public and that the public trusts them to make the right decisions and to step in and say, hey, you know, we can't really be having this vigilante justice because what's next? Is California going to propose a law that we have to, uh, you have to give up all your guns? And imagine something like that. I mean, what, what other uh, rights might be uh, infringed on here? So there's, there's a lot that's at stake here in this. Uh, it's a complicated issue. It's a very emotional, and passionate issue for most people uh, that, that that have an opinion on it. Uh, but you know, the solid majorities of Americans do believe that that a woman has a right to control um, her body and have an abortion, and that may vary as, as as to within means. But there, like I said, there's a, a big portion who have never gone along with Roe versus Wade, and I think that that um, that especially in these states, has always been a, of a high appeal. So this is how this thing uh, flew through so easily. And it's really um, amazing in this day. But I've, as I predicted a year ago, Roe versus Wade is out the window. Um, it's, it's going. So at this point, it's going to be how do the states adjust? How do we adjust as a nation? How do we prevent this sort of absence of rule of law as we understand it from taking hold? Uh, but my my prediction would be that you're going to end up with patch quilt of um, different abortion laws across the nation uh, that are sort of reflective of the uh, the communities in which they they take place. Now you have the state of Texas where you have how many tens of millions of people living there uh, that obviously this doesn't reflect um, half of those folks. But hey, they they got through the voting rights uh, evisceration a law. They got through gun control you there are there is no more gun control in texas you can go off the street and buy a gun without any background check now uh, the, the the laws that are being pushed through like you said what branch of government is functioning i don't know we have a great nation capable of doing great things but right yeah. now let me let me follow it looks like the house is on fire let me follow up on something um number i'm gonna give you three points and i'm starting to do it and i hope i don't confuse you on this but isn't it one, just as an observation, isn't it, isn't it interesting that as of yesterday, Mexico just decriminalized abortion, number one. Uh, so how convenient would that be for someone just to cross the border and, and obtain a, an abortion in, in Mexico? But what does this do? I mean, if other states um, replicate the exact law that Texas just passed and now has implemented, particularly regarding the rape and incest provision of this new law, what does that say to the GOP move forward for the 22 election? I mean, isn't this so extreme and so onerous and torturous to women that even, even women who supported uh, reversing Roe v. Wade, but ha having the rape provision in it, uh, that's even a bridge too far for those women. Uh, what does this say? Has the GOP, if they replicate all these in, in all of the red states, have they put themselves in a corner and basically sealed their fate for the 2022 election, Winston? Uh, it, you know, I think even polls inside of Die Hard, uh, I, I would call it formerly known as Republicans or those that identify as Republican, women do also support those basic uh, protections, even if they're generally anti-abortion. So I think, uh, you know, you've got these, uh, these Republican governors out there that are just trying harder to be Trump than Trump, whether it's in Florida, or uh, or Texas or or, or Christy Noem, um, you know, or whoever is just trying to make a stab at the future, uh, they may very well come back and see. Uh, you see it at DeSantis's uh, performance in, in Florida; he's underwater there. I, I think uh, Abbott is the same way that they've realized that this may be too far. Not just this; it's everything. This it's everything. This is just uh, sort of just sprung upon us, but. Uh, there's a lot more coming down the pike, okay. and it's just something that we got to see. Jay, we'll go to you to the same question. Has the GOP painted themselves in a corner, and uh, the other red states uh, copy word for word this law? Will they paint themselves in a corner for the 2022 election? No, the answer, no. 
No. There are a lot of there's a lot of time left. There's a lot of issues yet. There's a lot of um, you know Republican wins happening right now. Um, I don't I don't think so. But I do have some thoughts based on the discussion so far, and that's this. Um, you know, there, there seems to be chaos. The country is in chaos. I think you'll agree, uh, and it's more that that way every day. And, and, and you say, is this is this the Republican uh, strategy to create chaos? What kind of a strategy is that? It's stupid. But there is one person who benefits by this. There is one person who we know does have a, a strategy of chaos, and that's Vladimir Putin. If you guys watched 60 Minutes last Sunday, uh, they, did a, they did a segment, I think it was something they did before, about retired KGB officers living in this country who described the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the ascendancy of the Internet Research Agency and uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, early days and current days um, on how you create chaos and how you divide people. And one of the most chilling uh, points of that segment was uh, a, um, a, uh, a set of competing demonstrations in a southern city. I think it might have been Atlanta now, now, uh, over something you know, that you really can't get too excited about. It was masks, I think, maybe vaccines. I think it was masks. And one side of the street, these people were carrying signs and shaking their fists. They were vibrating with anger. They were spitting anger. On the other side of the street, the same thing. These people were so incredibly angry over an issue which was really not that emotional. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So then come to find our intelligence agencies reported that both sides of the street were fomented by the intelligence research agency that sent out social media creating each of the demonstrations and fomenting all of that anger and hatred. Um, and so, you know, you can take a point of, that's the style of it. You can take a point of vulnerability and you can work that point in this country. And there are a lot of people who go along with it and they fall on one side or the other. Vladimir Putin has been doing that for a long time. And certainly one of the biggest points is Roe v. Wade. But if he could do it with masks, you know, last week in Atlanta, then he can he easily could do it with a religious, you know, a religious type division, Roe v. Wade. So, you know, I think I think Roe v. Wade is dead, but I think the divisiveness is just happening. Uh, and I think we have to watch everything in that context. It's not something that just happened. Do our, do our security agencies have <clears throat> an obligation to let us know that so that the media can report on it and they so did. that we not fall on those traps? They did. It did. But maybe not enough. You know, is this whole priorities thing. What is the media going to report about now? So during Afghanistan, everything else is forced off the stage. The only oxygen goes to Afghanistan. And, you know, then there'll be COVID one week. That, it's like this one news story a week that, that is, uh, you know, prevails. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and it's very hard to let the, the, the intelligence guys in and have them explain the realities. And the bottom line, too, is that the, we have a generation of, quote, American citizens, end quote, who are not educated and don't care to be educated. Um, they're looking at social media. Um, they're not getting enough information and the right information. They've been separated from the right information. So what we have is Vladimir Putin running our sensibilities, running um, these div divisive things. And the country is in chaos. And he can turn it any way he wants. And he has done that in other countries in the past. So I think this is something that the people and us guys here on um, you know, What Now America should look at. Okay, thank you, Jay. Hey, switching gears. Uh, Winston, uh, President Biden went to the states of New Jersey and New York yesterday, and he spoke at length about the damage that the flooding that has occurred. And I think quite well, he tied it into two things. One was that the reality of climate change is here and now, and we may be past uh, the point of no return on some of these storms that we're going to experience year after year. But also, he, I thought he did a fairly good job of tying that into the 3.5, or excuse me, the $1 trillion infrastructure bill and stating, you know, the Build Back Better concept. Um, did you notice that? And two is, 
Was he effective? And will he, did he hit the mark on, on those points? Well, you know, the oxygen's being sucked out of the room for Joe Biden right now. Uh, he, it, it doesn't matter which way he turns. It's just getting worse uh, all around him. And he's a, it's a, a victim of circumstance in, in all of this. He, he's not causing any of this. He didn't cause climate change. He's not, he's like the West is on fire. The East is flooding. Uh, you know, the, the South is flooded. You've got, uh, you know, the Texas, just every every which way. You've, you've got covid absolutely crazy even to the point where here in hawaii where the governor signed an order and idaho they moved to crisis care or what do they call it where there's there's rationing the rationing care i i would rationing is a, is a euphemism they're coming in and they're saying okay you go to the left and you go to the right and basically that's what they're they're having to do because there's one nurse for six ICU patients. Yeah. There, you know, I can tell you right now that they're not performing CPR, um, you know, code blue. They're just not doing it. It's, 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 it's dangerous to the gonna, staff uh, and they don't have a staff. So whatever Joe, by infrastructure, Jay, when you were talking, what, rattling off those things, voting rights, infrastructure, you might as well have been speaking Greek, honestly, because the country is just so on fire. You don't know which way to turn. You just want to grab the kids and the pets and, and the birth certificates and, and get out of the house. But, you know, where are you going to go? It doesn't matter. And it is and, and all of it is like bellows on social media and, and media itself. It's like a bellows on every single issue so that there even if you agree on on climate change, what well, you're not going to agree on gun rights or abortion or uh, an infrastructure bill, people don't even know what that means. Joe Manchin, I was reading uh, the other day, why is he hanging, uh, hanging this up? There was an article that said something that he has you know, profited out of the coal industry. So again, maybe we need to just say, if you just off, off to the side, an infrastructure, literally a golden toilet for everybody in, in West Virginia. As a nation, we need to just completely buy every person in West Virginia a nice house, give them a subsidy so that he can vote the way that he needs to vote uh, if he's not voting in the interest of, if, if there's any self-interest there that he has that is preventing him from doing that. And Kirsten system from Arizona, I don't know what, what she's seeking either, but we desperately need so many of these things. If the United States doesn't lead on climate change as we're moving into um, you know, this meeting that's happening, I think it's in Scotland uh, coming up here, the rest of the world is just gonna say, why what are you even talking about you can't get it together in your country and it's on fire it's drowning and you you can't even spend a dime on this you're not even you know making the right noises so uh you know we need to regain that we need to regain our position the world leadership i thought there was an interesting uh comic in the in the not comic editorial cartoon where they had uh the u.s leaving afghanistan and on one side was taiwan the other side was uh south korea and they were both like sweating bullets right wondering and i think the same could be said of, of ukraine or whatnot so it may not just be the russians there may be others that are very strong vested interest in this country divided but on the bright side of things as uh vanity fair pointed yesterday uh, I'm leaning forward. I'm, I'm leaning forward because I want to hear this <laughs> very carefully, great detail. 2024 run, so there's a silver lining to it all, Jay. And uh, you know, I, I, okay, it's so depressing. I, I don't know. This week is like hard. It's hard. And next, week, you know, our our optimist by the name of Winston Welk has left the building. I don't know where he went, I'm but sorry, he'll be back. Is, I know. He, I know for I, a fact. He'll be back. I Thank you, Winston. Try. I got to. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to go to Jay with the exact same question. Jay, uh, to Winston's point, is climate change pretty much off the table? It, 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 no one cares. It's it's being drowned out by all the other calamities that are taking place in this country. Um, does Biden get some traction in Scotland uh, as he tries to address on a worldwide basis the the reduction of carbon in our atmosphere and and try to do something about global warming, climate change. What do you think? The answer is yes. <laughs> can you, can off, you throw me? Can you throw me a lifeline here? Can you <laughs> can you help me out here and expand that answer just a wee bit? <laughs> the, the answer is yes. It's off the table. 
there are so many, you know, raw meat stories and uh, social media tweets that come through that are that take all the oxygen out of everything. And uh, climate change can wait. I mean, that's that's been the perception of the scientific community, as you know from our movie that we made recently. Um, that's how they feel about it, and they're right. Climate change is the last thing anybody thinks okay, about. Okay, well, let me throw out a statistic. It's estimated that one third of all Americans have been adversely impacted by some kind of disaster event that directly correlates to our warming planet. Doesn't that make, doesn't that change things if you've been personally affected? You know, the funny thing is if you sit there and you watch it and you read about it, it's just hard to connect the dots. It's hard to bring that all together and say, hey, this is climate change. And here's the action we need to take right now. Um, it just doesn't come down that way. So here's a wildfire, here's a flood, here's a drought, here's a storm, and on and on. But, but the, mm, when the public conversation does not seem to bring those points together into a need for governmental action. So I think the average person you know, is, is just an observer, a wallflower, watching all of this. Hey, it didn't happen in my neighborhood. I don't shop here. You know? Um, this is this is a problem, but it is so, happening in their neighborhood. It is well, happening for there. some of them, some of them, not all of them. There's a lot of people in this country that the wildfires haven't reached. They don't care. Um, so, I mean, as it gets worse, Tim, I would I would say my answer will change as the wildfires spread. You know, as the droughts and the floods and the storms have more of an effect, people will, you know, be more conscious of it. But their first their first response is to respond. Their first response is to, you know, get the water out of the street in front of their house, to rebuild their house, to get power and water and sewerage and, you know, have their community start up again. They're not thinking about global issues. They're, they're thinking about uh, when will the tap work again? So, and that's the process that happens. That's the process that's happening now. And that's not the process that's happening in Congress. If you thought that somebody out there was listening to Biden in Congress or the Supreme Court or the state legislators, legislatures, uh, stop thinking that. They're really not doing much at all. And I think that means that, uh, you know, the, the, the species in general is failing as against the most existential threat of all of them. OK, I just said I'm going to change the name of this show. What now, America to what now, America hyphen nothing. <laughs> All right, Winston, we uh, run out of time. Um, your last thoughts and comments about what's happened this week. Uh, and you, you know, feel free to talk about any of the calamities that we've uh, touched upon here on the show today. Um, thoughts and comments, please. So basically, if you're watching this show right now, I just want you to know you are inside of a dream. You did take the blue pill. You didn't take the red <laughs> pill. You will wake up from this. <laughs> at some time and you realize it, it was a bad dream <laughs> sadly um for those of you who did who took the red pill it's not it's uh it's, it's not a dream it's reality it doesn't matter which way you point at this point we can't think about uh, all we can think about all the big things but you're going to get overwhelmed and and swamp yourself do what you can do what you can do is wear your mask, you can get vaccinated, you can uh, talk to your neighbor who isn't vaccinated on a human level, you can volunteer at your food bank, you can uh, you plant a tree, you can do what you can do. And, uh, you know, we all have this one right here if you're of a certain age, right? You have a special mark there, Tim. The I youngins do. don't have it. You know why? Because it worked. Yeah. That's why the youngins don't have it. And Explain, uh, it, because, <laughs> explain it because you've implied something that they may not be aware of. If, explain your uh, answer there. We have this of a certain age. If you're of a certain age, you got a smallpox mark. And as the, the, the comic said, Mommy, what's that? She says, why don't I have one? She said, because it worked. Because we got a vaccine years ago. We're dealing with, as Jay was saying, who's, to, to, who do we trust? We're dealing with the basic fundamental distrust of all levels of government from the mayor to the governor, to the uh, Congress, to the courts, to the president, to scientists, what's true, what's not true. It's just a really hard time right now. Be kind to yourself, be kind to everybody else. Start at the start where you are. That's my optimistic point, because that's the He's point. back. 
thing you can really control right now is just that. And even okay. then, turn off the TV. This is the last TV you get for the week until you come back again for what's next, America. I, I, I knew it would only be minutes before he returned, and that optimist within Winston Welch is back. Thank I goodness. Thank you, Winston. Appreciate it. Jay, you get to wrap it up. You get the last word. Um, you know, follow suit. Be optimistic. Say something optimistic, please. <laughs> Uh, and suppose I refuse. <laughs> that, you know that's part of the show. It's you're right. <laughs> I never left the I never left the building when I was a small child. My my mother said to me, you know, be thankful that you were born in in America. This is the greatest country, and I and I have harbored that thought. I harbored it through all of my schooling, through law school, for through the time I was certainly the time I was in the service. But I no longer feel that way. And you know, this is not the greatest country on earth. This country has has lost ground. Let me say also that, you know, when you live in a world of 7 billion people or a country of 330 million, that's very complex. It's a complex society. And in our lifetimes, it has become all the more complex with technology and, and telecommunications. And, you know, my God, we're surrounded with complexities. And they include social complexities. And they include social vulnerabilities. Um, so if you wanted to, you know, look at the fragility of it, mm, it's fragile. It's fragile all over the place. And Putin has a what amounts to a historically brilliant plan of dividing us. So I think he's found the fragility. He is dividing us. And I don't know if Humpty can ever be put back together again. But right now, uh, Humpty is falling off that wall. All right. You know, I suppose it's up to me at this point to leave our audience with an optimistic message. And that message is the following. What Now America will be back next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And, and, and guaranteed, it will have Jay Fidel and Winston Welch to join us. I'd like to thank you both very much for, for attending the show and adding to the conversation as bleak and dark as it was. But it's what it is. So I'd like to thank you. Join us next Wednesday, 11 o'clock for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And until then, aloha.